My name is Bob Wilson. I'm professor of church history at Acadia Divinity College. And this is the second part of an interview with the Reverend Dr. Freeman Fennerty, longtime pastor, church planter, evangelist, as we try to explore with him some of the things that have happened during his lifetime within Christian ministry. Freeman, it's good to have you here with us, and we appreciate your taking your time. And good to be here. I'm share. glad to share. Great. Freeman, in your first interview which you had with Jeff White, you mentioned a number of things in terms of church growth and that kind of thing. Could you tell us what role visitation plays in church planting and church well, growth? I may be uh, eccentric. I don't think. But if my ministry has been effective, it has been because of your ministry. I can't hold a candle to Charles Haddon Spurgeon when it comes to, uh, to expressing myself and swaying audiences. But I, I, I refuse to take a back seat when it comes to knowledge of pastoral ministry. I think the pastoral ministry is the key to serving Christ. We are the contact that people have with the church. Uh, if we're in with, uh, with our people, we're listening. We can f spot lots of problems before they even come to the surface. We can be there to show we care, and we certainly get their love and respect. I think it is the key to a successful ministry. Now, I understand that Freeman Fennerty often made well over a thousand visits a year in pastoral well, ministry. Give us some reasons why you did that and, and how you went about making and so how many calls. It, that's perhaps the, the better thing. Yes, uh, uh, one year I was in Kentville, I made almost 2,000 calls. I've come to the point where I feel the man is a bit neglecting his pastor work if he doesn't make at least 750 calls a year on the homes. I think it's important. Uh, unless the minister is where his people are, he's losing his contact with them, his influence over them. Uh, the pastoral ministries can wield a tremendous influence for Christ. And another thing, perhaps, is I'm persuaded that there's no real basic happiness in life unless people know Christ. I'm convinced of that. And so it, it drives a person uh, to do a pastoral ministry. It also gives you sermon material if you want to use it, to, you know, if you, you know what people's problems are and the, you know your scriptures, so you tie them up together. Now, uh, you may you ask another question how do you do it it's in your thinking it's in your planning uh, pastoral ministry to me has been priority even about preaching sometimes I think people will put up some with some very mediocre preaching provided they know the pastor cares and he's on his toes and not 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 lazy uh, but what I what I would do if I went to call on Bob Wilson and Bob wasn't home. Here I plan to spend half an hour at Bob's place or a quarter of an hour, whatever it happened to be, and I'm there. Oh, maybe across the street there's a home I haven't called on. So I take that 15 minutes and go and call at that home. Uh, I, I stand, if I have a committee meeting at 8 o'clock, well, over near that committee meeting location is someone I should be visiting or somebody who's sick. So I put calls in Every time I turned around, uh, I was looking for places where I might make it keep maintain a contact with a, a person or a family or a home. Does that answer your question, Bob? Yes. Can I follow it up with, with one relating to pastor and pastor's family? Yes. Yeah. This kind of time commitment means that there are some aspects of family which you either leave to your wife or you have to work in in other ways. Yes. How did you handle that? Well, there are some areas where we had to do some planning. Uh, my wife was very cooperative. I, I couldn't have done half of done, uh, half that I have done if it hadn't been for her cooperation and trust. Uh, take the telephone. I had no office secretary. I, I had to do the whole shooting match. Uh, now, my family, uh, uh, I came to one place in Kentville. I was working from early morning until late at night, every day of the week almost. I sometimes didn't take all my holiday. And one time, uh, I was sitting in the study, 
And so a voice seemed to say to me, Freeman, you may gain your point and lose your boy. And made me think about this. Um, I tried to shape my work so that I involved my family. If I were going and calling at Blue Mountain, which is 14 miles from Kentel, uh, I would say in the summertime, I'd say, Laurie, how about you and Perry going out fishing? So I'd take them along with me and drop them off at the brook. And when I'd come home two hours later or three hours later, I'd toot the horn and they'd be there for me. But I learned to sh share with them. Uh, I never had any let up till I went to Newfoundland. The first year there was the most relaxing I've had in my ministry. And Sandra was in her teens then. So I taught her to drive the car and we went on picnics and that sort of thing. So it's not an impossibility. If you get your family's cooperation, they understand. Uh, so I've never had any problem and I'm proud of my two children. How did you feel when Laurie decided to go into Baptist ministry? Well, it wasn't my decision, I'll tell you that. If I, Laurie and I, uh, <coughs> Laurie had his own mind. If I decided something, or he would take the opposite tack. He, w if I said the thing was gray, he said it was black, uh, just to be independent. So it wasn't any credit to me, excepting maybe indirectly. We were at Camp Shiktahawk. I was directing the camp there, and Master Lomney was there. And at the evening service at the East Jacksonville, I think it was, he called for life full-time commitment to Christ. And several of the young people of camp went forward, and Laurie was one of them. He made his own decision. From that point on, we were right behind him. <laughs> and thankful. Yeah. Now, I know that Sandra has had a variety of ministries as well, because she was in college with us at United Baptist Bible Training School. Yeah. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about her pilgrimage? Because both of your children have done some, I think, some interesting things in the Lord's work. Yeah, well, they have. Sandra has too. Uh, well, well, Sandra's a little different story. Uh, she made up her mind she wanted to be a church secretary. And so we sent her to the Bible training school. She was there two years. In fact, I think she was a valedictorian the second year. Here she graduated, finished. And from there she went as a Dr. Mitten secretary uh, at the Brunswick Street Church, Fredericton. Uh, when we were in Newfoundland, she was keeping company with a, a very fine young American chap and he was transferred back to the States and they correspond back and forth a bit. But they never got a chance to know it. So uh, she felt she should uh, transfer and she uh, went to Gordon College as secretary to the dean of students. Then Dr. Mitt Dr. Langley persuaded her to come back to take charge of the office at the Div College. And she came back to Canada. Uh, by the way, uh, the, she and the young chef founded, they, they were only teenagers then, uh, that they had grown up, that they weren't that much interested. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, while she was teaching, she met her present husband, who uh, was from Halls Harbor, which was a student pastorate. And in the wintertime, they used to come into Bethany Memorial to church, and Dave taught in the Sunday school. And so, uh, she and Dave linked up and got married. And uh, of recent years, she's been church secretary at the Bethany Memorial Church, and I'm proud of her. She does a wonderful job. She directs the men's choir. And I'm, I'm very proud of the two of them. And well, Laurie's doing yeah. the church extension work in the, in the Fredericton area now. Yeah. I was just going to ask you, I know that Laurie left one pastoral ministry fairly secure and went into church planting like somebody else we know. Well, <laughs> I'm proud of her on that. I don't know where Laurie got the idea, unless it was a sort of a takeover. I used to notice with Laurie, he would be different as a boy. He'd differ from me every chance he got. But if I wasn't watching, he was like a little puppy dog, following his master. He was, he was copying and doing things. <laughs> Anyhow, that's a long time ago. But uh, Laurie went to Marysville Church, Fredericton, and uh, he had to buy his home. His family was in school. So it came about five years ago. And uh, Laurie said, uh, uh, had this in mind, and in his hospital calling, he was picking up all these names from Hanwell Road, Hanwell Road, and no Baptist work out there, no work really, of any of very great consequence. And so he maintained his contact. He had the idea there. Then uh, about five years ago, he said, this is it. This is it. I'm going to 
give up my church. My house is paid for, my family are educated and married and away. If we're going to do it, it's now. So with no backing, he uh, set out to do the work at Hanwell Road. But what does the Lord do? Be interested in this. Uh, if I'd been there, I'd been working for nothing for him. What the Lord do? He makes he. I get called to Nomina's as acting senior pastor at three quarters salary. I just put it in the bank and make possible for Larry to carry on his work. Mm. <laughs> and they're fun at the same time. <laughs> Freeman, can I follow up on a couple of other things that you mentioned when you were talking to Jeff? What about the role of evangelism? You've already talked about home evangelism, but what about pulpit evangelism, that yeah. kind of thing? Uh, I have a very firm convictions on that too, Bob. Uh, uh, I look at my ministry as a matter of evangelism, really. Yeah, the pastoral work, uh, that's the purpose of it, win people for Christ. And uh, my role in evangelism has been twofold. One as a pastor, and the other as uh, in preaching. Uh, in, in pastoral work, I'll take that first. Uh, here's a family, a man and his wife, neither one of them committed to Christ, uh, both of them good people. I would go to them and say, look, how would you like like it if I spent an hour a week with you for the next five or six weeks and just talk about the Christian life. And it's been very effective. Uh, talk with the two of them, you see, and together they make up their commitment, make their commitment, and they make good members. Uh, that's the first way. Of, and also I've met with, in the same type of role, with groups of people in the church. I have a, a church membership or Christian life classes they cover five or six basic things in our Christian faith. And they've also produced uh, decisions. Then on the other hand, I've uh, taken part in about 20 evangelistic crusades. And they, they've all produced, I don't think there's been one that hasn't produced a commitment. Uh, in one case, there were at Gaspero a few years back, uh, there were three pastors came in on it. There were about 60 commitments at, at Gaspero. And for an ordinary pastor, you know, it, it shows what can be done. And uh, I, st I still think there's a place for that. Uh, they're doing an ex they did an experiment here in the valley this year and last year, where first it was three pastorates or, or four, and then, then two blocks of po three blocks of pastorates last time. Uh, I'm convinced that there was need, still need, for joint meetings. If they're backed, that one in Gaspro was backed by a lot of prayer, a lot of effort, a lot of invitation. And, but it produced, when you have 60, around 60 decisions, uh, something's happened. Mm. Certainly wasn't me. <laughs> Just one last question that goes back to what you said earlier. You told Jeff that you'd been active as a youth leader with the old Maritime Religious Education Council. Oh, yes. yes. And then that Walter Mason, of course, had been active in that That's as right. well, and you had succeeded mm -hmm. him at Kenfo. Mm -hmm. And then in 1971, our convention withdrew from the Canadian Council of Churches, and it raised a question for me about how you related to the whole ecumenical movement and, and what was happening in Atlantic Canada in those days. Well, uh, in, ec in ecumenical work, uh, I've always been involved in ministerials and the Religious Education Council, the Bible Society, and so on. My feeling is that, that we should cooperate in every way possible with everyone who's doing the Lord's work to the extent of where our own position is threatened, or, well, perhaps that isn't the term, but you know what I mean, infringed on, and, or it goes a different way. For example, if uh, we were to go to a totally liturgical trend, I might rebel and say, well, I think we need more freedom. Uh, or if we uh, for left go our evangelistic thrust, I would say, I'll have to part company with you at this point. But uh, when it comes to things we can do together, I think we should do together because we're a witness to the total community. Does that answer the thing, Bob? Yes. Yeah. Thanks very much. You've had a long ministry in Atlantic Canada. I'm just curious about the differences that you see in the role of 
pastor from the time you began, way back in the student pastor days, and, and the way you see pastors functioning today, whether there's been a change and whether you think it's been good or bad, or how do you evaluate that? Well, as far as the effectiveness of pastor ministry goes, I don't think that's changed one iota because I used the same principle at No Minus five years ago, which is modern, as I did when I started in uh, 60 years ago, and it works. Uh, pastoral ministry works. It brings you close to people, it brings people close to the church, and uh, uh, I see no difference. Uh, however, I do see some things that have happened in the uh, years between when I was studying, for example. Uh, the matter of uh, the position of counseling comes in, and I think perhaps it has been partly misinterpreted by the men. Uh, counseling has always been a big part of my ministry. You get thrown at you if you're a good pastor. It's right, left, and center you get thrown, uh, pastor and ministry, you get counseling in the picture. But there's been an emphasis on the mechanics of it. And sometimes I'm afraid there are those who mistake the mechanics for the real thing. Uh, uh, and, and it takes over from pastoral ministry. Uh, I'm, in, I'm, a, I'm a trained counselor, you see, and my office is here, and, and I'm, I'm very anxious to serve you, but I don't come because I don't know you. Uh, it should never... T uh, counseling is important. I took all the courses in counseling it's when I came back from Newfoundland, uh, and I, I find them useful, but they're only useful as tools. They're the means, not the end. Not the end. Yeah. It's not. Now, this is the one thing I see. Uh, see, what that does, uh, what has done, is it has meant a lessening of the emphasis on pastoral ministry's time, part of the minister's time. And uh, I uh, can't go along with it. I think the pastoral ministry is the is the priority. You are the shepherd, you are the leader, you are the one who's spiritual counselor, and the pastoral ministry has to be first. I would almost put it ahead of preaching. <laughs> that may sound like heresy. In the midst of your long time as pastor, what kind of changes have you seen in the Atlantic United Baptist Convention? Well, uh, I'm not sure because when you come in new, uh, you always have the feeling it's the, the people of experience up there who have to make the decisions and call the shots. But when you get into it, and uh, you are part of it, as I've been a recent last number of years, you develop a, a different feeling, and the feeling is on the part of the people at convention level, a deep concern and dedication, a concern for the welfare of the church, the, the development of the church's life. You see that. Uh, where in the f first instance, you, you view it objectively, you see. Here you're in the middle of it, but you do get a chance to see the dedication of the men involved. And we have a very fine, dedicated group of people there at the convention level. Was that, uh, is okay. that sufficient? To I was wondering, too, the, the structure has developed over the years. Yes. Okay. And there have been some significant yes. kinds of changes. Uh, yes. I wonder about flavor of the convention and, and your feelings uh, towards it. We've come through phases in convention life as I look at it. Uh, one of the things that I think has, I'll take the phases at first. The, at one time, there was a, a critical, there were those in convention who were very critical of everything. Everything had to be criticized. and. Uh, they, uh, at one point, uh, there was a group called themselves the Evangelical Something Fellowship, and uh, there was a reactionary one that uh, went the other extreme. And I was afraid at convention that there might come a, a real flare-up, and I was all ready to make a motion that we let these guys fight it out and let's go on the rest of the middle of the road, go on and do the job. <laughs> but of course, it didn't happen. But the, uh, the uh, thing that um, I see uh, can, uh, organizationally, uh, it used to be that the, we appointed secretaries like uh, home missions and Christian education and so on, 
and they threw on their shoulders the responsibility of the, of, they had boards behind them, but the boards hadn't the time to, to go into things deeply. Uh, but they were uh, left to do the, the job, and they did well. So, uh, but now with the new structure which came about well, perhaps 20 years ago, into areas with area postures and so on, I see the role of the area posture as a very important one, and they're doing quite a job at it if we give them the time to spend at what they're there for. Uh, it, uh, it gives a, a bit of support to the postures. Uh, in the postures in my time, we were on our own with our church and our deacon's board. Yeah. Now uh, you have the area posture that you can also fall back on for support. You trained at the old Acadia School of Theology and, and graduated uh, for the first time, at yeah. least from it. That's right. And then you have watched the Katie Divinity College grow and develop. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in your impressions of those two schools and changes you see having taken place uh, in relationship to theological education. Yeah. Well, there was a while there when you shift over from one thing to another and one faculty to another, uh, you watch some things. There was a while there I was afraid that a man could go into Divinity College and graduate with a very uh, immature or incomplete picture of the Bible and of preaching ministry. You can have, what I'm getting at is you can have so many courses, but you can only have so many, uh, you've got so much time. There's an effort now uh, to remedy that, and it would be impossible for a, a student not to get a, a, a basic knowledge of the Bible and of uh, the pastoral ministry. But at one time, I was afraid mm. that they had so much choice uh, and that some things were more interesting than others that they might neglect the essentials. I think they've overcome that. When you were a student, uh, mm. do you remember some of your professors? And oh, all of them. Oh, why not share with us a little bit about who we they were? We were part of a, of a family. Our group was small. I think, if I recall, we only had about 600 students in Acadia when I, uh, my year of graduation, which was the low, it was at the end of the, as the beginning of the war, end of the Depression, and oh, I think about 600 students. So uh, we had about, uh, I wouldn't think we'd have over uh, 25 or 30 theological students there. So the professors took a personal interest in, them, in each student. And we appreciated that. Uh, I, it doesn't mean we had any better caliber of teachers, but uh, I think there was more time to uh, to uh, associate with the students. Uh, doctors, uh, we, I'll tell you who my, they were at the time. Doctor DeWolf was just finishing. I had no courses with him, just uh, one uh, course I sat in on. Doctor Spidel taught us uh, ethics and the. Uh, uh, the courses like that. Uh, Dr. MacDonald uh, was the one who taught us the pastoral ministry, preaching and the pastoral work. Uh, Dr. Hutchings uh, was the teacher who uh, brought us up to date on Christian education. And uh, uh, the fourth one, there's, four, there's another one. Uh, Dr. Lumsden was the one on, uh, on the Bible. And then the, I was in that transition period when Dr. Wynn came in and, uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Fraser and so on. So I had a taste of the, of the whole group at that time. You were active from the early days also in the board of United Baptist Bible Training School. I'm curious as to what role you see it having played within our convention. Well, if you had been there at the start, you'd understand why it started. What was happening was that we were having mature students, mature people rather, who wanted to get some training. Uh, uh, some, a lot of them didn't even have their matriculation, uh, but they wanted to study and, and get into full-time Christian service. And they were going to Bible schools that had no sympathy at all with the, with the, the convention. And we were losing them. In fact, they were, they'd come back sometimes to tear apart the, the work at the home church. And it was almost a, uh, there was a sort of a sense of necessity of, uh, we've got to do something to meet this. 
And so it was set up, uh, they could finish high school and uh, get a good Bible background while they were doing it, and then go on to university. That was the start. And mind you, it was no picnic with, with the uh, equipment we had. The first, uh, you may have heard, you were Bible uh, at the ABC. The first time they got the foundation up and they used the basement of the church, and in the middle of it all, it leaked. They almost had a flood there. But thanks to Dr. Uh, Dr. Brinton and uh, some staff, Dorothy Dykin, some uh, that group, uh, they were able to keep the students interested, and they treated it as a joke and a, and a sort of an experience, and they pulled through that one. And then, of course, the Steves brothers were much, very much instrumental in getting the building up, the original. What about what's happened as the years have gone on? I know you've followed it with interest. So. Well, I followed with interest because <coughs> my two children both went there. Uh, Laurie finished his high school when he was 16, and uh, we thought, well, he's, uh, it would be a good thing for him to spend a year up at the, the Bible training school. So he went up to Bible training school and spent a year there. It was good for him. He got to, you know, with the gospel teams, and he got, uh, there was a little student, a place there he could go and preach on a Sunday afternoon. It was good for him. Then uh, years later, when Sandra finished high school, she wanted to be a church secretary. And there was a course up there, two years, that uh, uh, seemed to fit in with that, so she went too. I watched with interest the uh, change in the educational scene. That is, no longer are people living too far away from high schools. So you don't have the same need for men to f finish their education in an institution. I went to Horton Academy. Uh, others would go to, the, in later years, go to the Bible school. So it has had a natural growth to the college level, where the, where the people were that needed them. And it has been a good feeder for the theological school in the years since. Uh, I would almost hope it would stay at that point, rather than develop a theological department. Well, Freeman, thank you very much for being with us again for another interview. And uh, we appreciate you being so willing to share from your experiences. Maybe some of my experiences may be more hurt, hurtful than, than helpful. <laughs>